Today I'm going to talk about how incorporating the Anthropocene into the geologic, geological timeline might influence the way that we perceive time. And I'm interested in a couple of issues in particular. The first is how we perceive the rate of certain processes, particularly climate change and the way that plants and animals respond to it. And second, uh, how we perceive our place in Earth's history, particularly our relationship to the past, the present, and the future. I'm going to focus on visual representations of time because that's the primary way in our culture that we understand deep time. Here's a typical diagram of Earth history. You can see it starts with the beginning of Earth 4.6 million years ago and works its way to the present through the various eons, eras, periods, and epochs of geological history. The boundaries here represent major geological or biological events. So for instance, the border here between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic is the time about 65 million years ago when dinosaurs went extinct. Geological timelines present a particular kind of challenge to scientific illustrators. The challenge is how to represent something about the immensity of geological time while at the same time depicting the many events that might not be evenly distributed within that time. One approach to this is what I call well-formatted time. This approach basically says, what are the events I want to depict? Let's put them on the page in a way that looks well-spaced and pretty, and we won't make any effort to capture the immensity of geological time or the amount of time that different epochs, eras, periods, et cetera, take up. And you can see in this timeline that four billion years are packed in here at the bottom, and then 500 million years take up this much space. A second way of thinking about geological timelines is absolute time. Here's an example of that from a college biology textbook. And here you can see that time is more or less, not exactly, attempted to be spread out as it actually unfolds. The effect of it is that a lot of events are compressed up here close to the present. Um, you might also think of this as poorly formatted time. A third approach is exploding time. In this approach, uh, certain periods are exploded or blown up or expanded to reveal more detail and higher resolution. So here the Phanerozoic becomes its three eras, and then here the Cenozoic becomes its many epochs. So deep time is a difficult concept to wrap our minds around. One of the ways that educators attempt to help us understand what's going on with deep time is through the use of analogies. Right? An analogy is something where you understand something that is abstract or complex by comparison to something that is familiar or concrete. The most popular way of doing this is using a calendar. And here we see a version of exploding time, but with a calendar. So on the top here, and this is from, uh, this is an image that accompanied the new edition of Cosmos that's debuted this year. Um, so here we have annual time, the annual calendar, and um, in this example, the Big Bang starts off the year and the present ends the year. Um, so Earth forms in September, and then there's an explosion of time, and you see the December calendar, and you can see that dinosaurs appear on Christmas, um, they go extinct on December 30th, human evolution happens in the, the last few hours of December 31st, and civilization appears during the last 60 seconds of the year. Here's another analogy that's sometimes used. It's comparing deep time to geographical space. In this example, um, the beginning of Earth history is here on the west coast in San Francisco, and time moves toward the present 
as we move toward the East Coast. And so, interestingly, all human evolution happens in New Jersey, <laughs> and civilization is born in Atlantic City. <laughs> so what's the significance of these different ways of visualizing time? Um, I'm going to illustrate one of the points that I'm getting at by showing you an example from my calendar. This is of a field trip that we took with my class this year to Pack Exper Experimental Forest and Mount Rainier. And one thing you notice in this is that time on Thursday looks packed, crowded, busy, um, maybe a little bit stressful. Um, time on Friday looks really open-ended and flexible and sparse. And the way that we experience or think about time based on this visualization is that it seems like time is probably moving faster on Thursday, that it's speeding up, that there are too many events kind of packed into the day for them all to happen. And on Friday, time seems to slow down. In fact, both days were very busy and packed with activity. But in the visual representation, they look really different. So what does Earth's schedule look like? Um, in absolute time depictions, certain periods look much busier than other periods. In exploding time scenarios, a similar kind of thing happens, um, but a different effect is produced by the changing calendars that are used. So for instance, in this visualization, the languid afternoons of the Precambrian maybe take an annual calendar to keep track of. But once you hit the Phanerozoic, you really need a weekly planner. And once you get up to the Cenozoic, you need a real day planner to track your hourly appointments. By the time you get to the Holocene, way up here, the Earth is kind of like a lawyer keeping track of billable hours, breaking down every six minutes how the time is spent. By the time you get to the Anthropocene, it's a stopwatch where every second counts and is tracked. That message is reinforced all over the place in our culture. Um, there's a law called Moore's Law that many of you might be familiar with, which is that the number of transistors that fit on an integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. And so processing capacity and memory have increased exponentially during the past 50 years. Um, and that sense of time accelerating, of time getting faster and faster, um, appears in all kinds of books, articles, images, and so on. So the thing that I want to emphasize is that not everything moves at this accelerated pace. This is a point that Stephen Brand made in a book called The Clock of the Long Now. And he illustrates it in this diagram. So Brand points out that there are certain things, like fashion, like who's trending on Google right now, that change rapidly. There are other things, like infrastructure or governance processes, that change more slowly and there are certain things, like many processes in nature, that happen very slowly. One of the concerns with cli climate change, I think probably the biggest concern, is that the response of plants and animals to climate change is not going to happen as fast as climate change is going to happen. This is a diagram that depicts the various responses that species might take to climate change. One is toleration. That is, within your adaptive sphere, being able to live in a new environment. Another is habitat shift within a local environment. A third is migration a longer distance to a new environment. Um, and this is one that, for instance, scientists are actively working on and thinking about um, in, through a process called assisted migration, where seeds or seedlings of plant species are planted far from 
the current location of species in an effort to help species respond to climate change. If those approaches don't work, whatever combination of them a species might employ, um, then there's a definite danger of extinction. Oh, let me go back to this. So one of the things with diagrams that reinforce the idea that time is speeding up, that Earth is accelerating in its pace of things, is that the implication, the cumulative effect of those diagrams and the reinforcement from cultural images is that Earth's history and everything that is part of Earth's history is speeding up. It does not get at what I've been describing and what uh, Stuart Brand described, which is that things happen at different tempos. There are differential rates of different events on Earth. And by having geological timelines that make it appear as if things are accelerating, we create the impression that that acceleration is natural, that it's inevitable, and that everything that's part of Earth can kind of keep up the pace. But in fact, that's really not the case. The second question I want to think about today is how we perceive our place in Earth history, and particularly how we think about the past, the present, and the future. To illustrate this point, I want to look at stratigraphic time for a minute. It's another way that textbook illustrators use to describe time. So in this kind of visualization, um, the origin of the Earth, the beginning of the Earth, is deep in Earth's crust, and time moves toward the present as you move towards the surface. And it's meant to show the different geological periods as they move toward the present in the way that sediment layers upon sediment. So stratigraphy is that pattern that you get when you look at a cutoff by the side of the road or something like that of the different layers of Earth history built one upon the other. Um, one of the interesting things about stratigraphic time has to do with its origins. In the 19th century, this was a really common way of depicting time. And the pattern was to show this same process of time moving forward toward the present, from deep in the Earth's crust to the surface, and to do so in a way that implied progress of species as they moved forward in time. And this illustration does a good job of showing how it was often thought of as a ladder, that species climbed as they approached the present. There's a historian named Nicholas Rupke who looked at a lot of 19th century timelines and noticed that the pattern that you see over and over again, and it's depicted in another one here, is of this progression through geological time and this very definite sense that at the present, we reach a finale, a culmination of history, and history stops with the present landscape. And so this was very appealing to people in 19th century Victorian industrial England and America who viewed themselves as the pinnacle of this long process of evolution. <clears throat> the Anthropocene, I think, offers a way to think about geological time and our place in geological time in a different way. The Anthropocene is an epoch that looks backward. It's at the end of this long sequence. But it also looks forward. In most ways of thinking about the Anthropocene, it starts around 1800, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And so it's aware that humans have a long evolutionary history, interconnected with all kinds of other species. But it's also aware that the current geological epoch that we're in is one that humans have created the conditions for, and that humans are, by and large, the architects of. And so in thinking about the Anthropocene as the geological epoch that we're now living in, I think it helps us to look forward as well and to think about what we are going to do to the planet what species might survive along with us as we move forward in time, 
and what that future will look like. And I think that's what it means to live in what Stuart Brandt called the long now. Thank you. <laughs>